Independent Living Campaign Conference. My name is Brian Hilton and I'm chairing today's event. I'm a former ILF recipient and I'm a member of Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People. Before we proceed, we've got a few housekeeping items. Firstly, just to let you know that we will be live streaming and filming today's event at the request of people who can't attend. So anyone that doesn't want to be filmed, uh, if they could make themselves known to Andrew, Obi and Arjun who are doing the filming. Also, the hashtag for today, for those that are blogging and tweeting, <coughs> is hashtag right to IL. That's hashtag R-I-G-H-T to IL. Secondly, uh, there's no fire drills planned for today, so if the fire alarm goes off, we should all leave the building via the nearest exit. So, let the conference begin. I think we need to start by saying a big thanks to Deepak for making today possible, and also a special thanks to our late comrade, uh, Debbie Jolly, who, along with Linda, actually secured for the funding that made today's event possible. I'd also like to thank the team at Inclusion London for all their hard work in organising today's event. And it's particularly pleasing to see so many representatives from disabled people's organisations here. We have a few apologies. Uh, firstly, Jane Campbell, unfortunately, can't be with us today but wants to let us know that she's 100% behind the campaign. Jane is currently putting in a bid for a Lord Select Committee to inquire into disabled people's ability to live independently within the community. Also, apologies from Cheryl Houston, who was due to talk today about using the media to make the invisible visible. Cheryl is looking forward to working with us on our media strategy to take forward the campaign priorities that we agree on today. Cheryl also wants to hear from any individuals that are facing institutionalisation as a result to cuts to independent living support and who would be interested in contributing towards a ITV news feature. Anyone that is interested in that, if they make themselves known to either myself or Ellen uh, during one of the breaks. Now, <laughs> Anne's already volunteered. <laughs> yes. Uh, now, I want to say a little bit about the campaign to save the Independent Living Fund. Now, I've been involved in a number of campaigns over the years starting with the block telethon campaigns in the early 90s, through to the fax campaigns and the welfare to workfare campaigns in the early 2000s. However, it was the ILF campaign that I felt the proudest to be involved with. It was a campaign that had the most solidarity and support from other campaigners, other disabled people and the general public. It was a campaign that had clear and distinct strands, including public awareness raising through our media, legal challenges, lobbying of and meeting with politicians, and let us not forget, some bloody impressive direct action. <laughs> now ultimately, we didn't save the ILF, despite initially winning the legal challenge in the High Court. However, the assemblies in Northern Ireland, in Scotland and Wales, all went on to establish new funds. And I'd like to think that our campaign had some bearing on that. And uh, more about the situation in Wales later. If I had to highlight a failing of the ILF campaign, it was that as a movement, we were initially too slow to react. We didn't make enough noise when the Labour government undertook its initial review 
yeah. which resulted in the restricting of criteria for the eligibility. And similarly, we weren't vocal enough when the condemned government continually delayed the rolling out of the much promised and ultimately flawed consultation. However, that is not to distract from the power of our campaign and the momentum that we developed and maintained throughout. The key now is to use all that we have learned from what we got right to what we got wrong as we continue our fight for independent living. Hopefully today will help us shape that fight. So I'd like to introduce our first speakers today. From DPAC we have Ellen Clifford and from Equal Lives and North of DPAC we have Mark Harrison who are going to update us on some of the developments that have taken place following the closure of the ILF in 2015. Uh, we'll, firstly we'll hear from Ellen and then Mark after which we will take a few questions from the floor. So over to you Ellen. Thanks, Brian. So I'm going to start the day by giving an overview of where we're at, um, a recap since uh, last year's uh, National Independent Living Campaign Conference in Birmingham, which was a bit smaller than this one, and introduce some of the ideas that we're going to talk about today. The main thing we need from today is to agree our shared demands for the Independent Living Campaign uh, so that we can coordinate around that going forward. Can everyone see the slides? It might be... Okay, so for those who weren't involved in the initial Safety Independent Living Fund campaign, which this group has grown out of, I'm just going to give a little bit of background. So the, the campaign to save the Independent Living Fund, uh, it was never just about the INF recipients. Um, there was initially some criticism of the campaign that it didn't acknowledge what was happening to people who missed out on the INF. We of course wanted to, to protect the social care packages of everybody, so uh, there were some people, Kate Green, um, who was on the front bench uh, then for Labour, who said, why are you fighting so hard when it's only 1,600 people who are affected? But, an injury to one is an injury to all, so the disabled people's rights movement and other allies came behind protecting those packages for the 1,600. But it was also about using the ILF strategically. It was an important campaign that enabled us to highlight the wider and much more complex picture of what was going wrong in social care. We did actually um, send in a complaint to the United Nations on behalf of people who had missed out on the closure of the ILF. Um, that complaint is actually, three years later, still being processed. Uh, there's quite a lot of bureaucracy involved in the UN, um, but we will update whenever we hear back on that. Um, and ultimately, as Brian says, we were unsuccessful in our goal of saving the Independent Living Fund. However, we did have some wins, some positive outcomes that if we hadn't been fighting for something so important and so big, would have been seen as amazing achievements. So we delayed the closure of the ILF by three months through the legal actions. It meant the government had to retake the closure decision and look more seriously at what was happening to the ILF. And the judgments in the High Court, although we did lose the second challenge, the judges did make statements about the serious adverse impact that the closure would have. We raised the profile of independent living for disabled adults and got media coverage that's fairly unprecedented. It, it used to be the case that the media didn't tend to look at disabled adults, disabled children find disabled adults, we didn't get much coverage. <coughs> the top picture on the slide there is actually from a Channel 4 feature that was done on the closure of the ILF. Um, the picture below is of Rob Punton <laughs> and others storming the House of Commons, as the media calls it. <laughs> um, we also uh, lobbied. Uh, as Brian said, there were many strands to the campaign, so direct action, legal challenges, also lobbying. And although we were unsuccessful in getting the CARE Act, the wording of that law, to reference Article 19 of the Convention on the Rights, uh, to, uh, uh, rights of 
disabled people. We did get the statutory guidance to include a reference to Article 19, and that's been useful for lawyers and for legal action going forward. We also pressed the government into finding an additional 7 billion, nearly 7 billion that they didn't want to, for what they called the former ILF recipient grant. So that's money that they've allocated for local authorities from 2016 until 2020. Sadly, we know that many local authorities are not spending that money um, on former ILF recipients because it wasn't ring fenced. However, I think we still need to acknowledge that to get George Osborne to find that amount of money that he didn't want to was quite an impressive achievement. And the then Minister for Disabled People, Justin Tomlinson, actually told one of our fellow campaigners, John Kelly, that it was because of us pushing them into it that they've done it. Brian also mentioned the amazing peer support and solidarity that has been created through this campaign. And I know that those of you who are on the email group list um, are part of that and the support that you give each other every day I think is absolutely invaluable given what everyone's facing at the moment and then the campaign's also provided resources for people going through uh, reassessments and uh, put lots of people in contact with solicitors but we're facing enormous challenges for those people who have had support to challenge cuts to their packages what tends to happen is the local authority will then reinstate the package, but that's only pending reassessment. So many of you are stuck in cycles of continuous reassessment and the fear of your packages being cut. We've got some really good solicitors that we're working with, but they're all working beyond capacity because every single disabled adult with a social care package is going through um, the reality of cuts, and there's not that many of them who can do the work. We've seen the limitations of the judicial review process as a way of challenging cuts to social care packages, most recently through the Davy case. Judicial review looks at the lawfulness of processes, but it's not adequate way of dealing with whether social care assessments um, are wrong and the wrong decisions have been made. Judges are very unwilling to go against the professional opinion of social workers. They also don't want to micromanage government policy. The danger when you take strategic litigation and you lose is that it then sets a precedent and we're seeing quite a scary situation in Hounslow at the moment where they're interpreting the daily judgment to mean that they don't need to reassess anybody before they take away uh, the ILF portion of their package. We've also disappointingly heard that the green paper on social care which the government promised, which is forthcoming, will focus only on the needs of older disabled people and will exclude working age disabled people. But to be honest, that's not really very surprising. The Green Paper came uh, as a result of the outcry against the Conservative Manifesto's dementia tax um, that they had in their manifesto for the 2017 general election. And really what they're worried about is how to fund social care for older people. Um, they want to make disabled people pay for their own social care. Disabled people of working age are usually, there's a, a link between disability and poverty, not going to be able to pay for our own care. So it's probably a question they want to avoid. They're also proposing that local authority pays for social care through 100% retention of its business rates. So ending the money that comes down from central government to local government. And that inevitably is going to mean even less money for social care. So the, the challenges are enormous. The common issues that we're seeing to individuals um, whose social care packages are, are being cut, um, social workers coming in with an agenda whereby they're being forced to cut packages. A recent community care survey showed that two thirds of social workers who responded to the survey um, have been uh, told by managers that they need, to make, they need to go in and make cuts to people's packages. We're seeing personal assistance increasingly replaced with technology and equipment, which often doesn't meet the needs of the disabled people. Care managers aren't following Care Act procedures for reassessments and reviews. People quite often aren't told whether they're having a review or a reassessment, and according to the Care Act, the procedures used uh, for, for those are different. And increasingly, assessments are being done in very intrusive ways. So 
very detailed information that people have to give about how uh, about the personal assistance that they receive, but also any number of people coming in to, to watch sometimes without without notice being given that people are going to turn up your at your house and want to watch you uh, receive your personal care. And we've also heard of a case where. Um, the care manager wanted to put in some kind of technology that would track exactly what the personal assistant did in the day. Very intrusive into people's personal lives. Many local authorities won't fund nighttime support anymore. We're seeing a misinterpretation of independent living, whereby the idea is that people should be, should be doing things for themselves, whereas we know that independent living is actually about having choice and control over your own life. There's an increasing reliance on unpaid support. People are being told that if they want to do things like participate in the community, they'll need to find a volunteer or a family member or just people that you know, like your neighbours. Increasingly, local authorities in the search for funding are referring people for continuing healthcare. Often that can be an inappropriate referral, but those assessment procedures are also very intrusive, they're very lengthy, and it adds to the stress on people to go through that, particularly if they're then going to find they're not eligible. People are reporting great difficulty recruiting personal assistance with the low hourly rates that are paid, that's not surprising, but we're also particularly worried about the impact of Brexit, and uh, many of the personal assistants um, come from EU nation states and we're very worried about restrictions on freedom of movement and the impact that will have. There's a lack of infrastructure support for people to manage their direct payments and personal budgets. People are being left having to manage things, uh, changes to employment law, uh, changes to through case law on uh, hourly rates for nighttime support, pensions, etc. People are being left without the support to manage those things. And care managers often don't understand so people will be, for example, um, told that their hours are going to be cut uh, with only a week's notice, without an understanding that actually people employing their own personal assistants have to abide by the employment contracts that they have with their POs. And also, as Jenny's going to talk about in her workshop, we're seeing charging policies being introduced by local authorities that are much, much harsher. Although there, there is good news on that in that after a campaign by local people in Enfield, we've just heard that Enfield Council are withdrawing the policy, the charging policy that they were planning to introduce, which would have um, cost disabled people a lot more money. So, <laughs> there is good news. Yeah, well, yes, because what we were really worried about was we were seeing this cascade effect across London boroughs, whereby because a few of them had done it, the others were all saying, oh, well, they've done it, so we'll do it. So the fact that Enfields, we've managed to get that in Enfield, we're hoping, because Redbridge is also consulting, so hopefully we can get a good result in Redbridge as well. So what have we been doing since, since the last national <coughs> meeting in July? We've been evidencing the impact that the INF closure has had. There was the Inclusion London report that came out at the end of last year that we launched in Parliament. Channel 4 uh, worked with us and they did a round of freedom of information requests similar to the ones we've done in London for a national picture. And the Department for Work and Pensions also uh, published their own evaluation which showed there had been a serious adverse impact for the closure. It didn't state that. What it stated was it was it's all a postcode lottery and they didn't include any statistics. But the qualitative evidence they showed showed that individuals are definitely um, facing serious barriers as a result of the closure. Uh, one of the ILF campaigners, Claire, who I don't think Claire from Gloucester is with us today, she raised an issue around prepayment cards and people being forced by local authorities to use those when it didn't meet their needs and went against their wishes. Uh, Inclusion London worked with Claire, and we got advice from a solicitor, so there is a template letter for anyone who wants to challenge their local authority on for forced use of prepayment cards. Um, and also, In Control then worked with Claire and the Shaw Trust on a report into prepayment cards um, and the situation. And uh, basically, there are a handful of companies who are making a lot of money by selling those to local authorities. 
People may know Fleur Perry from Disability United. Fleur looked into the issue of CCGs and their capping policies. Um, she did some freedom of information requests and found I think, there were 44 uh, CCGs with policies that uh, breach the Care Act. The EHRC have now written to those asking those CCGs to respond. I think the responses need to be back about now and the EHRC have threatened that if those CCGs don't respond to them, they will take legal action. We also did a lot of work this year uh, with the United Nations. At the end of last year, the Disability Committee published their report into the investigation they carried out under the optional protocol. Um, they investigated Article 19, the right to independent living, as well as looking at social security issues, and their conclusion was that uh, welfare reform had caused grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights. This year, 2017, the UK government was also examined uh, under the Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities. Again, independent living was a major thing that we raised, and in the concluding observations uh, that came out in August, again, the UN were very damning the situation in the UK. Alongside those concluding observations, they also published, the Disability Committee also published a general comment on Article 19. So a general comment isn't, doesn't just apply to the UK, it applies to any country where uh, the UNCRPD is signed up to. But I think they had uh, a lot of things happening in the UK in mind when they wrote it. It's very positive um, in terms of pressing for an interpretation of independent living that we understand, it being about choice and control. So I think that we've got some copies outside, but I've done copies of the general comment for everyone with just um, a briefing on the top page of the key points that come out for that. One of the things they said in that particularly relevant to, to our current fight, they said that institutionalisation also applies to people when they're in their own homes, when they're trapped and they're isolated and they're segregated. Nathan in Wales, who sent his apologies and can't be with us, has been campaigning very hard to save the Welsh Independent Living Grant. So the Welsh Assembly has said that when the former ILF recipient grant ends, they will be transferring responsibility to local authorities in Wales. So the same picture as we've got in England. And of course, we've seen how badly that's gone here. He's trying very hard to put pressure on the Welsh Assembly to reverse that decision and to follow the example of Scotland in setting up a new uh, Welsh Independent Living Fund. The Welsh Assembly are very against it, so he's been fighting an uphill battle. Um, however, he has had support in the picture on the slide, that is Ken Loach, holding one of um, uh, Nathan's campaign postcards, the Brian Hill design. And if anyone can offer any help to Nathan, then please do get in contact. We can share his contact details. In particular, I think he really needs to be in contact with more people who, uh, who receive the Welsh Independent Living Grant. There aren't many in his area, so he is getting a lot of support from allies, but we really need some more ILF recipients in Wales involved in that campaign. We also held, a couple of weeks ago, the National Disabled People's Summit, and there was a workshop on independent living there, and Mark will say a bit more about what came out of that when he speaks. So what are our opportunities going forwards? So although the green paper isn't going to include disabled adults of working age, the government has said there will be a working stream, a work stream that looks at working age disabled adults and Inclusion London and Reclaiming Our Futures is going to submit our thoughts to the Cabinet Office on what that work stream needs to include. We also think we need to start trying to influence Labour Party policy. They've given a commitment to enshrine the UNCRPD into domestic legislation if they were elected. They also made a commitment in their manifesto to set up a national care system. Um, they haven't given many details on what that would look like and what we think we need to do is to agree what our vision would be. Mark's going to say more on that so we can start lobbying for that. The Equality and Human Rights Commission have just instructed a barrister to explore different options to legislate for a right to independent living. The Care Act, as we know, is not working in protecting the right to independent living for disabled people. What would it look like if we had a law or 
could we change the Equality Act, for example? There are different options to be explored about how we put that into legislation. And then the funding for today has come from research projects that DPAC's got funding for to explore alternative models of independent living. And Steve's been at Steve Gravy, who is here, who is doing a PhD um, on independent living, is going to lead that workshop so we can look at cooperative models from abroad and see what characteristics of those would be useful for independent living over here. This is a suggestion of some of the priorities you want to, might want to agree for next year, and this is really what we want to hear from you all on this afternoon. We obviously need to continue to monitor and evidence what's happening, what the impact of the closure of the ILF has been, what's happening in social care. We need to continue to provide support for individuals, so that peer support networks, but also putting people in contact with solicitors to challenge when their packages are being unfairly cut. We do want to look at strategic litigation. We've, we have Davy, but in the main, the activity with uh, solicitors has been fighting against cuts on an individual basis. We can't fight for every single individual package. Nobody's got, there isn't the time or the capacity. If we could escalate to take a, a case that would set a positive precedent, that would be helpful. We need to set out our vision independent living support system that we want to see and the other thing that's been raised and I have also copied sorry there are so many bits of paper a uh, briefing that Simone Aspis did she says apologies she can't be here today but Simone feels very strongly that we need to fight institutionalization what we're seeing is a return to institutionalization not just in terms of people being trapped in their own homes but also in terms of a rise in care settings, um, Southampton Council, for example, whilst cutting people's packages, invested in several million in a new super care home. Uh, extra housing is being used in a way of resegregating people. So those are just some thoughts. To finish, I before we move on to Mark, I'm just going to show a film, just to remind ourselves of how powerful we can be and what we can do when we put our minds to it.
Thank you. <laughs> I think uh, that video uh, sets the context and the tone mm -hmm. for how we think change is going to occur. Because um, we know it's not going to come from politicians or professionals. It's going to come from us. Um, and that's why this conference is so important, as was the Disability Summit uh, earlier. Uh, this month. Um, Sorry, so we think it's really important that we we take control of our lives and the agenda around what we want from a right to independent living. Uh, we don't want other people deciding that because we know uh, if policymakers, politicians uh, set the agenda, then they'll water it down, uh, they'll corral us into systems where it's non-disabled people assessing us, measuring us, restricting us, and doing all those sorts of things. So. This is, start, this is an ongoing process where we can really have our voice, where we can say what it is that we require from uh, a right to independent living, a legal right to independent living, and what that should look like in practice on the ground. Um, and we began this process in the workshop on independent living earlier this month, as I said, at the Disabled People's Summit. And we're taking it forward into today's conference. And what I tried to do is capture um, some of the themes um, that emerged in that workshop uh, and from our members in ROFA, in Equal Lives, in DPAC, um, of what, and in this, the, the campaign to save the ILF, uh, of what good looks like. So this is about creating a vision, not hamstrung by politics, austerity, cuts, uh, any party political uh, position. This is what disabled people see as what we need in order to live equal and independent lives. So I think what emerged in the, in the conference earlier this month was that we want a right to independent living. And certainly that's what the United Nations is saying in all its uh, judgments on the British government, in its uh, article on uh, uh, independent living. And we want a universal national independent living service. We don't want the postcode lottery that is social care at the moment. And so it needs to be paid for out of direct taxation. Uh, we can't have it being rationed by Labour or Conservative authorities or whoever, whatever political party happens to be in control locally. We can't have our lives being determined uh, by local politicians and local interest uh, uh, where, where we might just lose out. It needs to be free at the point of delivery alongside the NHS. So we move away from this ration system where it's means tested, <coughs> where only those poorest disabled people in society have access to social care. Because what we're facing at the moment is a catastrophe. And what people, that's what the UN said, but that's what disabled people said in all the workshops and the conferences, that the local authorities are cutting budgets by 50, 60, 70 percent. Many disabled people are having their social care completely removed in the assessment process. So it feels very much like the transfer from DLA to PIP, where tens and hundreds of thousands of people are losing their, their right to uh, PIP uh, through that transfer process. Every time people are assessed by local authority social workers, the, the packages never go up. 
Disabled people's needs go up as we get older, our lives become more complex, but as our, our needs for support to live independent lives go up, our packages are being slashed or removed altogether. So it needs to be free at the point of delivery and based on need. Clearly, the government has nothing to offer. Um, they've delayed again the Green Paper. On the expert group, there are no disabled people, there are no D DPOs in terms of designing the new system. And as Ellen said, it's just fo focusing on older disabled people, how they can grab people's houses to make people pay for their social care. Um, and it's been de delayed to May 2018. Um, local authorities have had cuts of about 40%, we reckon, since 2010. Uh, and the cuts over the next four years that are working their way through will take that way over 50%. So that we're seeing the sorts of budgets cuts to direct payments, support, direct payments, uh, social care, up around 40% and it will go much higher. Each local authority around the country now are preparing budgets for next year with hundreds of millions of pounds locked in. Because adult social care is always, or nearly always, the biggest spender in any local authority, that means the cuts will disproportionately hit disabled people. Personal contributions. There are a whole number of issues around uh, the lack of social care, or as we call it, the No Care Act. The Care Act has enabled local authorities now to means test even further and reassess people's income. And we believe that a lot of the practices that local authorities are implementing are illegal, that they, they breach the No Care Act guidance. Personal contributions is one of them. In our local authority in Norfolk, they're doing remote uh, financial assessments on people. So people are now receiving bills for their personal contributions, which have been risen, uh, uh, and some people are getting bills for their social care that are higher than the actual value of their personal budget, their personal... So, you, you couldn't make it up. Uh, I spoke, we, we've had a whole number of people contacting Equal Lives and the local authority as well, ironically, saying they're giving up their social care because they can no longer afford to have it. Because if it's a question of do I eat, do I pay my rent, or do I have social care, people are giving up their social care. So you've got the, the situation where people have been assessed as needing social care under the Care Act, but then they're giving it up because they can't afford it. And this is a ridiculous situation that we're in in uh, 2017. The uh, other issue that is coming up within, and it affects disabled people's organisations who are supporting disabled people to manage their personal budgets, to manage their direct payments uh, and manage their own care. And um, local authorities, as Alan said, are bringing in payment cards, not for our interests, to make it better and easier for us, but so that they can monitor what people are doing. Although there's no level of fraud in personal budgets, they're bringing it in so that they control the system. One of the other things they're doing is that they're taking away contracts from DPOs for supported accounts, uh, for payroll, for employment support, and taking it in-house. So they're saying that they're going to do it. So Surrey Centre for Independent Living has had 60% cuts to its funding because the local authority took away the supported accounts. Our local authority in Norfolk is doing the same thing to equal lives. So we're going to be doing a survey uh, coming up around personal contributions because we want to de delve into this more <laughs> but also we want to hear from other DPULOs in local authority areas where similar things are happening because this is uh, again 
restricting choice and control. Okay. It's going back to uh, the bad old days where social services control our lives. As I said, every local authority up and down the country is facing uh, huge austerity cuts over the next four years, up, and th up through to 2022. And it's Labour authorities as well as Tory authorities that are doing this. So I'm really pleased that Ellen said the focus is on the Labour Party. I put together with Peter Beresford an article based on the workshop at the Disability Summit, and that's in this month's Labour Briefing, which is targeted at the leadership of the Labour Party, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, to actually get this on their agenda. Because what we don't want to be fucked off with is some sort of rehashed social care system that's based on private uh, providers uh, with the postcode lottery that we have. So it's really important that we also, um, you know, have that conversation in the lead up to a general election uh, with the leadership of the Labour Party. And I think we really need to um, move the conversation on. It was fantastic that John McDonnell made that video that we played at the beginning of the Disability Summit, where he said he's going to be taking DPAC and disabled people uh, into government with him. We need to have co-production before the Labour Party goes into government so that the system, uh, we're ready to go from day one with a system uh, designed by us. At the moment we've got a system based on the poor law or the principles of the poor law uh, of, of means and needs testing. The interesting situation I think where it differs where the poor law was based on you know, the deserving and the undeserving poor. Uh, and in the past, we've been seen as the deserving poor. But the poisonous rhetoric, the poisonous discourse, since the coalition government came into power, and now the successive Tory government, is that we're no longer seen as the deserving poor. We're seen as a burden on society. We've, we're problematised. We're, we're seen as useless eaters. As, you know, and that's not good. Um, that's not acceptable. So it's moved on. Um, I think the research from the University of Oxford that was published last week, which showed that 120,000 older disabled people and care home residents have died as a result of the uh, cuts to social care since 2010, is very powerful. And we need to use that. We, when we did the submission to the United Nations, both for the inquiry and for the uh, government's examination. We used evidence uh, uh, and we evidenced every argument that we had. The government's report was a disgrace. It was all based on assertion and not backed up by anything. And the fact that they kept saying we're the leading uh, government in country in the world around disability um, was completely blown apart because the UN actually said to them, actually the evidence shows that you're going backwards and you're not. So we've got very powerful evidence to back up everything that we're arguing for. So and I think that's really important that we, we are going to be uh, designing a new in right to independent living and what an independent living service would look like is based on evidence. <laughs> evidence. Our lived experience the experience in this room and in the wider disability movement, but also on evidence from research of what doesn't work. So we're going to plan today, take the planning forward for what we want from an independent living service. We're not, it's not going to be rationed uh, based on neoliberal uh, ideology. It's not going to be there for private providers to make profits off our backs. And we're not going to be assessed to death. It's, we're going to abolish the postcode lottery and take it away from local authorities. We don't want local authorities determining our future. Personalisation is dead, as is the Care Act. It's not fit for purpose and needs to be scrapped. And it, the new system needs to be based on 
the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People uh, and our contributions and the committee inquiries and the concluding observation and general comment on Article 19. So we're going to have it enshrined in law and the, these are just emerging ideas but I think it's really important that, that we discuss these and come to a view uh, of how we, 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 we want it organised. But the thoughts were, are at the moment that we need a new independent living service managed by central government, led by disabled people, but delivered locally. And that we need to um, learn the lessons and build on the independent living fund as a model for uh, what we want for the future. I'm not saying the independent living fund was perfect or ideal, but what can we learn, what, can, what were the best things, what can we learn from that, what can we take forward. The local services need to be shaped and delivered by user-led disabled people's organisations, cooperatives and social enterprises. It will be, be for need, not profit, and it will not be means tested. It will be independent of, but sit alongside the NHS, and will be funded from direct taxation, as I said earlier. The much, there's a much bigger job to do in helping the NHS move to adopting a social model of disability, distress and ageing. So it will need to be alongside the NHS, not absorbed or taken into the NHS. Because again, we would lose our control, we would lose our choice. Um, and um, it, we need to move away from the, obviously, the discriminatory and cruel approaches of welfare reform. So this National Independent Living Service needs to sit in, in central government. And what we're talking about is two things really. We need to have a focus across government because independent living isn't just about social care and that became, came out of the workshop very clearly. Although people in the workshop said, if I can't get out of my bed, if I can't get out of my house, there's no point in having accessible transport, there's no point in having accessible education, because we're prisoners in our own homes, or we're, if you're stuck in an institution and can't escape, then there's no point. So social care is a big priority. So we need to move disabled people's independent living out of the ghetto that it's stuck in at the moment in the DWP. The Office of Disability Issues is stuck in DWP, which labels us as welfare scroungers, as welfare recipients. We want a cross-government body that's going to address and have action plans in every government department to make disability equality very real, whether it be in transport, education, uh, schools, arts and culture, whatever. But the independent living service needs to be nationally organised in central government and, and delivered, as I said, by disabled people's organisations. It will obviously work with non-disabled allies who share our critique of the existing system and who work to social models of disability and distress. The other thing is we need to recast the debate, the dialogue, because at the moment it's a very negative dialogue, it's a, a, a very negative discourse. And we need to see disabled people and social care as an economic generator, a social and economic generator. There's a £1.5 million workforce which at the moment is a, a marginal uh, pool of low-grade, low-skilled, low-paid workers. We need to see that and recast it as a jewel in the service sector crown, in the service industry crown. We need to see disabled people as, in a positive sense, in a positive uh, way of uh, us growing economies, 
So in rural areas, for instance, in Norfolk, um, disabled people who live in, in villages are often the largest employer in that village. If the pub's closed and the shop's closed, the disabled person who employs five or six PAs is the major employer in that village, is a major economic generator. So we need to recast the, the, the discourse, the, the arguments. Um, we also need to say, see it in terms of thinking about our well-being. The CARE Act is supposed to be about well-being. But as everybody knows, the first thing to go when a, a social worker assesses our budgets is well-being activities. They're just taken away. You're not allowed to go to the gym anymore. You're not allowed to go out with your mates or go to the pub. You're not allowed to join an adult education class because they won't pay either for the class or the, or the gym membership or they won't give you a PA to get there. So it's completely uh, upside down. So we need to see it in terms of turning the arguments on its head and really getting those arguments well rehearsed uh, and well evidenced. Um, we need it to take account of the changing demographics uh, and the need, increasing need for all disabled people and people who acquire their impairments through their life course for support and to improve well-being during the life course. So at the moment it's polarised as, as Alan said. The new green paper is not going to talk about most of us disabled people of working age, it's going to focus on how they can grab the resources from older disabled people uh, and get their house off them to pay for it. Um, we need to change that discourse and thinking about a lifelong service of in how we support the whole of the population to live independently, to live well. So it's a needs-based, person-centred approach that will value us equally and be concerned with our needs, whatever our role, whether we are a disabled person, a worker, a service user or a citizen. And it would offer a truly sustainable and rights-based economy and society. So it's a much wider debate that we need to uh, locate our demand for independent living in. So I hope that's just raised some of the themes that have come out of the discussions we've had so far in, in the conferences and in our DPOs and clearly the demands of the disability movement really need to live. So nothing about us without us and professionals on tap not on top have to guide this. We have to be in control. It has to be, it's our lives we're talking about. So it's us that has to take it forward, determine what its shape it looks like and we need allies in, as politicians, in policy makers, to come alongside us and support us, to be in the lead, not to be just tokenistic adjuncts to what they wanted to do anyway. Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mark. Thank you, Alan, for that. Uh, I think a lot of those themes are going to be uh, discussed in the workshops that were going to start in a little while. We have a few minutes for questions and comments from the floor and I think Ellen you're going to be rolling with the mic so if someone if you could raise your hand Ellen will come over to you and if you could say your name and then make your comment or question. Hello, my name is Robert, Princeton Star of the Video. Uh, <laughs> I, I just like to say um, both Mark and Ellen talked about the Labour Party. On Thursday, I went to uh, in Birmingham, I went to Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald's post budget speech. And on that conference, we mentioned a lot, as Ellen said, about how they're going to be supporting all people 
but nothing. I love getting out for a long fight. I don't quite every time, but uh, she, yeah, but there was nothing as I said about young and disabled people, but also the language, the rhetoric they use when they talk about social care. I'm 55, not five. I don't need care, I need support to live my life independently. And until we do get them to talk, around the language that is appropriate for us to live independently, then we really need, if they're going to be the next government, we need to get in and do that now. Um, hi, <coughs> sorry. My name's Carlo from uh, Northamptonshire. I think to really is to do with what we were talking about, about refocusing, and the language as well. I think we should dump the liberal, in the neoliberal uh, prefacing of this, and um, really tell it like it is, the, the debate in the way the present government would like us to be and submit. It's more a question of being neo-fascist <coughs> rather than being a neoliberal, without a doubt. So we, we simply must fight this. Uh, get it so it's disabled people on top. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm, I'm Claire from Invisible. Um, I think um, care relates to everyone's relationships in the whole world and care for the planet and, um, and wildlife. You know, it's not something that's just restricted to disabled people. And to get away from patronising relationships and break out of the situation we're in, we need um, unwaged family members to be recognised and to get the living wage. Um, you know, that's the way for us to get out of the situation where we don't, we're trapped and we don't have a choice. And um, I don't think that what we talk about today should just be people of working age. I mean, for example, my, uh, my dad's passed away now, but um, I, I was helping to uh, look after him before he passed away. He did not want home care. He did not want to be the employer of anybody. Um, he wanted his family members coming, and um, you know I, I was not recognised as a carer. Because, you know when I needed to park at the hospital, I couldn't get blue badge parking because I wasn't a patient there. You know, so you know we we want to put something out which integrates um, disabled women, women carers, and the whole the whole issue of the millions of well, unwaged carers as well, and for them to get the living wage so that we're not, um, you know, stuck in a, a situ an exploitative situation. Um, hello, my name's Chris and I come from a very small town, uh, which is probably the large, I am the largest supplier of um, labour in that little small town. I come uh, from a history of disability. Uh, I have now three companies all of which lead in um, uh, disabled people's um, uh, needs and, and um, um, to name them, uh, I'm chair of the Disabled Golf Association. Um, I'm also a fellow director of the Disa Caribbean Disabled Sports Association. Um, and I'm also um, a trustee of a group called Save USAP. Uh, just to put it on record, our local council, which is Stroud District Council, um, had, uh, up until uh, the beginning of this year, uh, something like 800 independent sheltered living accommodation. Uh, they've now closed 20% of that, and they propose to close many more. Uh, the problem is, is they're not, they're not building any more sheltered accommodation, and the people who are being kicked out of their sheltered accommodation sites are um, uh, basically being put onto the end of a queue of 3,000 people um, all of whom are finding that it's difficult not to get uh, accommodation. 
let alone that accommodation which is specific to the uh, elderly and disabled. Um, I would also like to say that I've been through the PIP and the DLA process um, and I've got, more, I've got more problems than you could wave a stick at and yet I was turned down. I immediately threw the problem back at them and within two weeks I got a complete reversal. So I must stress that in order to get the people to listen to you at the DWP, you must get your application in for a referral as soon as possible. Last but not least, um, I was on the DAA, which a lot of people may or may not know, which was the organisation, uh, the Disability Action Alliance, which was set up by the Disability of, um, sorry, the Office of Disability Issues. Uh, it lasted for two years under the old coalition government. Then uh, everyone decided it was not going anywhere because we were being asked to support uh, policies were, which were being produced, which no one had uh, a desire for. So there was a mass walkout, um, and now it's, it's disappeared. So, you know, we are genuinely, that was the first, I believe, Duplo organisation um, run by a government and it failed, um, purely and simply because they didn't want to support it. Uh, the, the disabled people within the organisation knew it was a con, and, and within, I think, within six months, uh, everyone had literally walked out of the, uh, of the Disability Action Alliance, and now it's no more. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Sarit Patel, I'm from Newham. Um, Newham was really brilliant with inclusive education in the past, but it's going backwards. So disabled children are really suffering, they're in more units and whatever, and then the parents are suffering. I do agree with that lady's point about carers, and especially if you're a service user, and they do not recognise you being a service user and a carer, and sometimes you've got no other choice because you haven't got the funding that you need for social care for your loved ones properly because they don't understand the system because they have serious mental health needs. Um, the system plays them against you, and it's all this bureaucratic, um, whatever they do, the system. I think, like you said, I agree with what you said, that we should be taking the lead. Uh, we should be leading on our, our people's needs. We should be independent of them. Department of Work and Pension, you put a complaining and then you don't even get a response back. That's how much they value us as disabled people because they don't even recognise us, really. They don't even respond back. Um, and that's terrible. That's, that tells you that they don't value us. Yeah. Um, but how do we address this? We've got to fight united like we're doing today. And we've got to challenge them. And I think we've all got to campaign Labour is in our council, but yet we're struggling. So again, that's something that I regularly go and see my MP, but I tell him, and I say, well, I want change. You know, for us to get more Labour waters, we need to see change happening at local level for our community. If it doesn't happen, we can't support you. Um, speaking as someone who went into sheltered accommodation at the age of 23 as a young bride, I'm now almost 80. I didn't fit in at 23. I don't fit in now. I'm really pleased yeah. that they're getting rid of sheltered accommodation. What disabled people want is to be included with other people not put in ghettos. Any more comments, or if possible, I'd like us to move on to our workshops. Yeah, because we are. Okay, one more. Two more. Two more. Okay. <laughs> oh. Three. Three more. And then we'll. Okay. <laughs> so, Serena, um, I, j I just want to point out um, that um, under austerity in the stretch of social services and social care, um, there's a, actually a hierarchy in how they kind of allocate need um, and supporting that need. For example, people with mental health issues, they're completely omitting any kind of um, obligation to support. I know of one individual um, who, when she applied for her notes from the local mental health hospital, um, 
she found out that 10 years ago, she was meant to get a care package and 10 years later, no one has spoken to her about that. So mental health, people with mental health challenges are, are not getting the care as well. And um, because it's, it's an invisible disability, um, they tend to want to support people with visible disabilities. Hello, I'm Mary Ellen, I'm from Hounslow. Um, and I just wanted to say what's happening in Hounslow and compare it to Hammersmith and Fulham right next door to us. In Hounslow, um, they've, uh, in my case, have, um, decided to just stop the independent living component part of my care without any notice, without any written warning. I've had to fight them with the help of a lawyer to actually get that reinstated, and they reinstated it temporarily while they continue my assessment. Um, and right next door in Hammersmith and Fulham, um, they've decided not to make any cuts to care. Not only that, they have decided not to, uh, to scrap all charges for care as well. So it is very much a postcode lottery, and we really need to fight that and get it centralised again. Uh, but what, as we're getting that change made, we really need to think about the wording of what we use and uh, we don't, as, as was pointed out uh, earlier, uh, I'm 55 and I don't need to be treated like I'm five and I don't need to have someone care for me, I need someone to support me. Um, and we don't need a care act, we need a support act. Uh, <laughs> um, we need to be the, the, the ones in charge and the ones that are being heard. Um, I really wanted to say, an enormous thank you to Inclusion London and Deepak for all the support I've had and I'm continuing to have. It is an enormous battle and it's driven me to feeling quite suicidal and uh, self-harming and um, I don't want to see anyone else have to go through this. So, thanks. My motto is that our life is our own and then we should take that away from you. Okay, we're running behind, <laughs> which uh, maybe was to be anticipated. So we're going to rejig things slightly. So instead of breaking at one o'clock for lunch, we're going to break at 1.30. So we're going to move into our workshops next. So in the purple room, which is just across the corridor from us, is going to be workshop facilitated by Jenny. Yeah, Hi, Jenny. And that's going to be on charging. And in the green room, uh, the workshop is going to be facilitated by Rob. Rob's somewhere. Yes, Rob's there. And that's going to be on hourly rates and recruiting PAs. And in this room, which is the yellow room, it's going to be assessments and reviews, and that's going to be facilitated by Mark and Tracy. Tracy's here, is Mark here? I don't know if Mark's here. Oh, that's Mark Tracy on her own. Tracy, yes. <laughs> okay. So if, so if we can make our way to the workshops, and we'll break at 1.30, and... For lunch. Okay, guys, back in uh, back in a few minutes, I'll be back shortly. Live streaming that one. Okay.